over the years we've tried to sort of make music that your feet can move to and your head can think about or your heart can feel, you know. We wanted to get a combination of mixing dance music and rock. If you can call it rhythm rock is what we were, we're into. Motown definitely, you know, is an influential aspect to an excess. It's like a soul thing, really. I mean, that's what I love about soul music, is that there's movement and energy and, and rhythm. There's a groove element, there's a dance element that lies underneath a lot of that stuff. Similarly, the Beatles, uh, you know, had a rock and roll kind of swing. But they're, they're basically m sort of moral songs, you know, they're songs about you know, being good to each other, taking care of each other. They're, they love songs, but not in the sense of, they're not trite, you know, they're very passionate. You know? Well, the Kick album was a very, very important album for NXS's career. Uh, on lots of levels, we'd had uh, chart success prior to that album. It was our sixth studio album, but the chart success we'd had prior to that was a mixed bag. Kick, to me, was an extension of Listen Like These. That was the first record we made with Chris Thomas, and it felt like we just sort of had really got it happening. We came up with What You Need, which was a top five hit then for us in the United States, and that really did change things in a big way for us. We knew what we had to do with Kick as an album, so Michael and I talked to the other guys in the band, on a tour bus, I think in Germany of all places, and said to them, look, you know, this album we're about to make is a, it feels like a big career move for us. Um, this is not some funny financial pitch to make more money than you guys, but if you really trust us with the songwriting, um, you know, we'll do what we, we'll, we'll try to give you 10 what you need, you know. And the guys to their credit said, okay, you write all the songs, the two of us. And we went, all right, because we had our mission statement, you know. So we sat down, we really carefully designed Kick. It's a lot of planning and, I mean, we've taken a long time to do this album. Guns in the Sky was the, was the spearhead track on the album. Um, great song. See the sound, it crashes in. Guns in the Sky appealed to me because it was just two chords. <laughs> so I wasn't going to have any problem learning that um, or the arrangement. Guns in the Sky I thought was really, really cool because it was so simple um, and that's what made it so powerful. And Michael wrote Guns in the Sky. We decided to, to co write Kick together, Michael and I, and had the blessing of the band. But we wanted the song each we decided, where he would write a song and I'd write a song and neither of us would object to what we both did. And well, yeah, it was a sense of, it was almost sort of a bit of fun, if you like, and a bit of competitive as well. So Michael said, well, this is what the idea I want to do, but he never played an instrument, right? You know, Michael, he, so he, the irony was he asked me to help him program the drum machine and, and play the guitar, but I, I was like, it's his idea, his song, his lyric and everything. And I played a lot of it onto the demo for him, but the same with the song Mediate, which you'll come to in a minute, was a similar thing. I couldn't have that vocal edge the way he wanted. I had the lyric and everything, I had the idea in my head, but he helped me. So it was reciprocal in that sense, and you know, I, I, I loved that about working with Michael. He, he, he was really, we had a great rapport like that. It was funny, I bought my son this little flying V guitar that was like this long. And I ended up playing the solo on that guitar. And it's almost impossible to recreate it without playing it on that little guitar. 
Guns in the Sky. The rhythm for Guns in the Sky is, is really quite brutal and repetitive. It was a kind of an assault in the senses, if you will. We'd recorded different sort of you know, single hits of the snare and then single hits of the kick, and then we'd combined different samples, made them into one, and then triggered the, you know, the, the, the bass drum parts and, the, and the, the snare parts to make up a beat. The sound, it, crashes in. it wasn't a drum take, per se. You know, it wasn't me sitting on the drums going, do 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 ka do ka do ka You know, it, that was programmed. Into the air. That's all around you. Guns in the Sky, great song, great lyric. Um, the world was very much in that sort of Reagan era, um, you know, the, break, the breaking down of, of, the, of, of the Cold War period. And Michael wrote the lyric about the Star Wars program, was initiated, you know, that sort of thing. I remember being visited backstage uh, in America while we were on tour by um, John Kennedy Jr. He came to see us to talk about his concern. He'd heard the song and, and thought the lyric was quite anthemic and powerful, and came to tell us, you know, that to be careful in a sense in America with lyrics like that because it's quite a, you know. Guns the sky. The guns the sky. We never saw ourselves as a political band, um, and it was very un unfashionable in the 80s to be overly political. There weren't many people doing it. Guns in the sky. The video for New Sensation was shot in Prague and Czechoslovakia and of course back then it was still behind the Iron Curtain. And it was freezing outside, I remember. And we're, we were all in suits, we're dancing around. And I said to one of my kids the other day, well, I think the reason we're all jumping around like jumping beans was to stay warm more than trying to look funky. I was going somewhere to, let's just keep moving here. Sleep, baby, sleep. Now that the night is over. When we were in Prague shooting the videos for New Sensation, um, which was excruciating because it was shot on an animation camera, and each frame was six seconds long. So it was like a succession of frames. So you had to be like. Like that, you know, it took forever because they had people in, all dressed in black, like sort of ninjas, um, with like pen lights and you know, with cellophane over them, you know, little mag lights and stuff outlining us and stuff like that so that they could draw on the frames. I remember doing this, my, my solo part at 3 a.m. out on this balcony and it was freezing and I had to play the solo like this, you know. New Sensation was kind of started off as a sort of blues feel thing that Michael and I were working on. Um, and it was a lot slower and it was sort of a lot more moody. Uh, when the band and Chris Thomas, you know, we started talking about the song, we decided to up the tempo of it and lift it up and, you know, get a bit more sort of, you know, upright. With the tempo um, at 117 beats per minute for memory, that, that, that is just, just get, it's starting to groove along. John, my, my brother, the drummer, really nailed that feel in that song. It's just a great, fun, up song, and it's funky. Devil Inside, you know, that was was quite a cool kind of song at the time. Mike wrote the lyric. Um, he had heard a demo that I'd done of the music um, backing 
that I did here in London, um, actually in a hotel room, and I I constructed the, the the riffs and the idea of it, the song and everything in my mind. And he was looking for a song that had a bit of a, a doink 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 riff and something a little bit more edgy. Devil Inside, it, you know, it's it's quite an upbeat song, um, and uh, I think you know, actually, it's quite a complex sort of uh, construction of different parts of that song. Didn't really have a chorus, you know. I sort of came up with this thing like, why don't we try Devil Inside? Devil inside, every single one of us a devil inside. Because Michael had the lyric, but wasn't sure how to sing it. Devil inside, the devil inside. Every single one of us the devil inside. Devil inside, devil inside. Every single one of us the devil inside. With the combination of Michael's sort of attitude and the lyrics, you know, um, it, it was not hard to kind of get into the zone with, you know, lyrics like Devil Inside. I mean, it, you know, with the kind of drum tom thing and the chorus were sort of, you can imagine a, a, a bubbling brew of, of you know, um, voodoo happening, you know, in, in the chorus. So that's what conjures into my mind when I'm playing, playing the chorus. I love the way it goes into a solo so early in the song, you know, when it drops to the G. One of the th great things about Chris Thomas, to the producer of, of Kick, um, is that he really understood guitar sounds as well, lots of sounds actually. Getting that, that guitar sound with the JC120 through the Marshall. I love all the guitar sounds that he, he pulled up. Words and weapons, sharpen the knives, makes you wonder how the other half die. How the other half die, it, you know, antidote to how the other half live. The devil inside. Yeah, yeah. Oh. The devil inside. Yeah. Need You Tonight was shot in uh, a warehouse in uh, one of the ports in Sydney. Actually now it's a big, you know, awesome real estate there now, but at the time it was just, you know, a, a funky old warehouse that we managed to, you know, blacken off and, and set up um, some lights and, and, and shoot the video. But um, I'll never forget, uh, Michael's brother had his rat there and I ended up in the video. <laughs> 21st century is yesterday. You can care all you want. Need You Tonight was bizarre, and as much as halfway during the recording of the Kick album, we decided to take a break. Well, it was actually Chris Thomas's suggestion. Um, so we took a break, and then I flew to Hong Kong to work with Michael. But before I left home in Sydney to get on the aeroplane, I had a, a, an eight track tape recorder, and I, I wrote the backing, the riff, and all that stuff, um, and I put it on a cassette while the taxi was waiting for me to go to the airport. Got to the other end, he goes, you got anything new? I said, yeah, and he, he go, I go, I have to listen to this. I pull it out of my pocket, literally. He puts it on and goes, great. Picks up a pad and writes out that lyric. Because the arrangement, you see, is weird because it was my demo and I did it so fast. It has weird things in it that aren't correct in a, in a musical sense. There's five bar sections in it and things that I just overlooked because, you know, it was pre-Pro Tools and everything had to be manually played, you know but he then wrote the, the vocal around my anomalies of my own mistakes in the demo. And give me a moment, your moves are so raw. I've got to let you know. It's very, very sparse. I mean, there's very little instrumentation on it, which is part of the beauty, I think, of a lot of the best music around. So there's just a, a straight four on the floor, you know, just a, a straight beat that's carving right up the middle all the way through the song. Cause I'm not sleeping There's something about you, girl. The reason I like The Clash so much is that it didn't overplay things. You know, they kept it really simple. Need You Tonight, for me, is like that. I'm lonely. The drum programming that I'd done on a on a 707 Roland drum machine, I thought was a bit throwaway at the time. Um, Chris became absolutely obsessed 
with getting that drum programming onto the record. Because he heard it, you know. He got it, I think, way before we did, actually. Yeah, he, he, he was right on that track. And what gave it a little bit of a unique kind of in excess feel to it is the percussion around that and sort of pushing out the beat and kind of being back on the beat. At the time, that was definitely uh, separating some sounds that was, were happening with other artists at the time and in excess definitely had something quite unusual there with that. The song Mediate, see we did all this stuff on two inch tape in Hong Kong. When Chris Thomas heard it, he, he put it together immediately and went, it's the same BPM as Need You Tonight, it's 110 beats per minute. And he went, right. He got out a razor blade, stuck the two together. It was the first cover of another artist's video. The whole thing was shot in one whole take, you know. Uh, so the timing was imperative. Of course, I'm the drummer, I, my whole gig's like timing, you know. I got the timing wrong, <laughs> and uh, and uh, in uh, in the editing suite, um, uh, they had to speed up or slow down the the picture. So I was actually in time for the next bloke who came in with the cards. It was quite hard to get the timing right, you know, um, and we sort of had to do it pretty quickly. You know, is it taboo to borrow such a, a, an iconic um, and such an original idea for a video? Such a, a, a very Brilliant idea. You know, this is this whole renegade kind of rogue driving around a car, not actually having a location in mind at all, uh, rocking up to this really massively dangerous coal mine, um, breaking through the gates and going in where there's massive, huge trucks. Appreciate, depreciate, fabricate. Eventually, it didn't take long before security found out and they kind of ran us out of town. I programmed the drum machine. The engineer had a beautiful big Fairlight keyboard thing and I was talking with him about getting some more jazz and sort of ethereal kind of ambient tone across that feel with, it, with that constant, you know, um, every, everything ending in eight. With, you know, so it would, it would be a bit dreamlike. I actually wanted to try and achieve that. <laughs> We'd actually already recorded the love one. <laughs> We must have had a love affair with a loved one, but we recorded the song previously in about 1980, and it was okay, but we didn't really feel like we did it much justice, and we used to sort of fool around with it in the live set. We were sitting in the studio, and Chris was, you know, sort of thinking about, you know, we needed something else that was a bit more anthemic for the record, you know, and, uh, and I, I sort of, played him the original version we recorded of the loved one and he went right let's do that and Kirk looked at me like Ooh. And I knew I'd upset him it was really clever of Chris Thomas to kind of get us to do that because that's where we're really relaxed really comfortable we're not worrying about you know who's writing it or you know the arrangement's pretty straightforward it's a no-brainer just go out and play it Helpless, baby. And it was odd because the band had never recorded a cover before and we ended up recording one cover twice. <laughs> a great song, Jerry Humphreys, brilliant. Take one step out the door. Wildlife, fun song. Great lyric, good fun to play. A whole lot more. Wildlife is interesting in as much as I think we were trying to uh, get 
that sort of um, funky thing going in as many tracks as possible, which I think we did. I think we did it with Guns in the Sky, New Sensation, Need You Tonight, Mediate, uh, Calling All Nations, and we did it with Wildlife. And what we wanted to do was to get this sort of rhythm rock thing very much down as part of the theme of the album where, you know, you could, you could take just the, uh, as I like to call it, you could almost, you know, take all the vocals off the album and it still, it just thumps along, you know. Wildlife, for me, as a drummer, trying to integrate some, some kind of, you know, risky sort of virtually overplaying a little bit in some of the, uh, the, the post-chorus parts. Chris was really open to like letting me go on that, just let, you know, got a little bit uh, fusion, you know, but then I could kind of ro ro rope it back in and it's like make it nice and straight in the verses. And that's some of the beauty of that song is the verses are really like really open and quite uh, disciplined. But then after the chorus comes in, it's just all hell breaks loose, you know, and then it comes back in to you know, really bring it down again. And I think that, that was fun to play that song with. Life. Wild life when it's bad, it bad enough. Actually, I don't know why we don't revisit that song live now you're mentioning it. I actually miss it in the set. But there's so many songs that I miss in our set that, you know, I mean, honestly, my fingers would drop off if we played them all. Don't ask me what you know is true. Don't have to tell you. I love your precious heart. Never tear us apart. We, we couldn't, I don't think we could ever play a show without playing that. I was standing. Yeah, it's a classic. You were there. You'd have to think that um, it wouldn't be an in excess show without playing Never Tear Us Apart. Once you hear that song, even in, in its demo form, you knew what you had to do. My little riff, the dang, 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 um, part has always been, you know, like, you know, a highlight for me, I suppose. <laughs> It's been covered by so many people. I mean, Ben Harper was doing it live. Um, in fact, Adele's covering it as we speak. I'm actually overwhelmed at the interest in these songs that we put together. Having had many artists recently coming forward and wanting to, to re record this body of work. Because we all have wings. But some of us don't. I don't honestly think that we really understood at the time when Michael and I were working together that our work would be so recognised as songwriters because we started off as a pub band. We, we, we were really the soundtrack to everyone's weekend. The songwriting thing was very organic with Michael and I. I think we, we, we became better at it. I think the really significant thing too about Michael's lyric writing, particularly with Kick, a lot of people think, still think, I think when he and I wrote songs together, that we would always be in the same room. One of the great ironies of the way he and I worked together a lot was we would talk about an idea and we'd both go away and sort of work on it separately, which is a good way to do it in a sense because you didn't have the other one being an old biddy and nagging over his shoulder, you don't like this, and I wish you'd done that, and how about this, and you know, you both, we both gave, gave each other the creative space to do whatever the bloody hell we wanted to do. I was there. Then when we 
come back together. He would have you know, some lyrics, I would have some music, and then we'd, we'd sit there literally and mix and match the bits together and try to figure out what worked with what. You know? and, and most of this was surprisingly organic. Mystify. We were in Chicago. We were in this little demo studio. There was a, a grand piano there, and Michael and I, the way that we demoed it was a lot darker sounding. Um, and, but I love the lyric. I love Michael's lyric of Mystify. You know, it's just brilliant. You know? There's an intro part that just, you know, it's, it's not just straight in with drums or anything, so it sets it up quite well. Andrew and Michael kind of combo there with the starting with the piano and then all oh, bells and, in, and into it, and it's, you know, it's it's been a really fun song to play. You mystify me. The beat was very different to the way it was recorded on the album. It sort of went. That was the beat. All bells are messed in. Like that. That's how the feel was. When we got together as a band, I can hear the excitement of the recording of Mr. Fire because it started, became all bells are messed in. <coughs> Streets are blue. It's much faster, you know, and that's great because it captures all this energy on the recording of it. I need perfection. Some twisted selection that tangles me to keep me alive. It all that exists. It's a good song. I think it's an important song uh, for Kick because it's not just straight 4-4, four, four. there's a bit of groove and a bit of swing in it. I, I think that was good for us to do that. Mystify was a great band song. It's been a really fun song to play and uh, it has always been an important part of our set. Look, it became, you know, um, one of the favourites. Um, and again, you know, it's, uh, I don't think there's been a concert that we haven't played it <laughs> for, you know, a long time. Well, it's great part from the ending. <laughs> <laughs>
which is strange considering when I listen back to it now, it doesn't sound anything like an acoustic guitar song. It sounds quite sort of, da -da, it's like a real sporty sort of anthemic, you know, brassy thing. was an exciting song, it was something to wiggle your hips to and, and uh, um, I think, you know, it's a perfect sort of antidote to something like Never Tear Us Apart. It's been used um, so many times for sporting anthemic things because it's this great big chorus, you know, that kick thing, which of course is great for footy and all that sort of thing. Calling All Nations, great, great title. Um, and you know, if if the album wasn't called Kick, you know, I would have probably gone with Calling All Nations. In fact, we'd called one of the tours Calling All Nations. Calling All Nations was one of my favourite songs off off Kick. Actually, at the time, we wanted to have that kind of groove funk rhythm rock thing. It was kind of like a hybrid of rock and hip hop with the great lyric, you know, come on down you know, to the party, calling all nations. Michael penned that lyric as well. It's a great lyric. The song itself is funky, it's cool. I mean, to me, that was kind of a perfect example of, of an in excess funky. It was a bit sassy, there was a bit of, you know, I love playing that every night, the kick to a, you know, calling all nations. Really cool. Tiny Dag has actually started its life, for me musically, I was almost thinking, uh, which sounds kind of funny now, but I was thinking almost Elvis. Tiny Daggers, to me, reminded me of a Rolling Stones song. It's tempo and the guitar parts and, uh, and everything, and you know. It kept reminding me of a Bruce Springsteen thing, I don't know why, but um, it did. It has the right balance too, between the music and the lyric, where the lyric is actually pretty dark, but the music's very up and very, you know, sounds very positive and forward focused and, but the lyric is quite dark, yeah, and, and, and it works great together, that, that sort of, you know, um, oranges and lemons, you know, sweet and sour thing in songwriting usually works great because it, one happens to balance out the other and neutralize it and it all hopefully works. If you're watching this thing, it most likely means, unless you're watching it with John Farris, that you stole it. I want you to know I know who you are, where you live, and where your kids go to school. There's Dallas, you can see out the window there, bro. You got that, bro? Look, do you want to look through my revos? You want to look through my revos? Yeah. Here you go. You gotta put your arm out of the way, though. Oh, that's good. Ah, oh, yeah. Well, I'm seeing black and white, but um, I'm sure one day it'll look better. When we look it back, when we look it back, you know? When we look it back. When we look it back. Guns in 
My baritone is broken, it's been dropped. Appreciate, depreciate, fabricate, emulate, truth 
time here, a special day. The animals we know, guilt to bane, the insurrate, a better rate, a youth irate to liberate. Fascinating, intoxicate, and deinstate. Me. 
Bottom tonight. Australia. Yeah, of course. Yeah. yeah. But we've had Mick Jagger here, mm. all these big names, and in excess have absolutely outsold all of them. How yeah. do you feel about that? Good. I mean, so it should be. We're Australian bands. <laughs> I think about how this whole album made me feel when I was 13 years old. And how it made the world feel, and how it made them get up and take notice. My job is to take the car to pieces and then put it back together again. You have to recreate what the record actually sounds like in order to make it immersive. To hear it in this immersive situation was at first a shock. There are all other kind of intricacies that come out in an immersive mix. They have to be very delicately balanced. When we first heard it, we were like, oh, you know, it's kind of lost that uh, in-your-face kind of sound. I did the first pass, and the guys were saying, listen, we're just missing a bit of rock and roll here. Turn the guitars up, give it a bit more bite, give it more energy. I went back and looked at everything again because I had their ears on it, and they were there making. I mean, it is called kick after all. Hey, that 
Moss now puts this whole swing on the track that you just but, don't hear in Australia. Really have, eh? Yeah. What Giles has done is not only recreate to the true mixes the mm. way they were, but they even sound better now because you hear all this stuff you just didn't hear before. How can we fall into this record? How can you feel as though you're close to the band? How can you feel their inspiration, everything they did? You came Michael close to you, here is breath. You hear the guitars, you hear the drums, the keyboards around you. It just evokes a feeling of energy. Nowadays, we hear music too much and we don't listen to it enough. I think the great thing about Atmos is it makes people listen a different way and it becomes new again. And let's face it, In Excess are an amazing band. You have to respect this process. These are guys who made a classic record.